Board of Education, um, Tuesday, April 9th. Uh, Mr. Rich, roll call, please. Ms. Smith? Here. Ms. Fox? Here. Ms. Weems? Present. Uh, I myself am here. Ms. Heinrich? Here. Do you have a quorum? Thank you. Um, if we could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, recognitions, uh, Dr. Delgado. Thank you, Mrs. Heinrich. We're very pleased to have several recognitions this evening, and we're going to get right to it. First up, we have our support person of the year. I'd like to welcome to the podium our wonderful Assistant Superintendent of Talent Development, Mr. Brad Paddock. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Delgado and the Board of Education. This evening, it is my pleasure uh, and joy for all of us to share with you uh, the support person of the year and teachers of the year for the Farmington Public Schools. We are so fortunate to have passionate, skilled, and dedicated team members in our adult staff community. Tonight, we will honor some of the very best who were nominated by students, families, colleagues, and or principals. This year's teachers of the year and support person are without questioning all phenomenal employees for FPS. We started this process in January following the announcement from Oakland Schools that the Oakland County, both programs would once again be running this year. Here is an overview of the rigorous process that we use for determining the teacher of the year for each level. Each school building submitted to HR their one building's finalist. The next step was to group nominees by level and redact all names, school, subject taught, or any and all information that would suggest or identify the who, and, and finally, any names on the nomination packets were assigned only reference numbers. Full individual and redacted nomination packets were provided to a selection committee composed of previous teachers of the year, association presidents, HR personnel, and administrators. This committee was then asked to provide a thorough review of materials and eventually through conversation and dialogue, a finalist from each level was revealed as the last step. Our three district finalists um, eventually move on and their applications were considered for the Oakland County Teacher of the Year and the Support Person of the Year, also known as the Betty Campion Award. All four honorees this evening are extraordinary employees who strive to help and support make Farmington Public Schools the best educational institution for staff and students. They have shown their passion, enthusiasm, joy, and care and commitment for all of the FPS students and families, time and time again. I want to take a moment to talk about the order of the program. The order and directions for this evening will be each honoree will be invited up to the lectern and stand in close proximity uh, so viewers at home can see while I say a few words about each individual. At the conclusion of the remarks, the individual honorees will be asked to be congratulated by you individual board meetings, as well as congratulated by Dr. Delgado, and collect uh, a certificate, as well as a $300 check. After that, they can come front and center for pictures, if anybody wants to kind of move down the center aisle or off to the sides for some pictures, uh, if you wish, with their certificate. And then at that time, only if uh, the, the honorees wanted to say a few words, I will have a, a microphone there for you to do that. As reflected in the agenda for the audience members, this evening we, we will have this celebration as, as well as our athletics recognition. And remember, it is the goal of the Board of Ed to take a short recess only after both of the recognitions here this evening. Um, it is super exciting to acknowledge these four individuals with you in person and, of course, those of you that are watching from home. I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. We will start with the support person of the year. To introduce this nominee and winner, I would ask my colleague, Mr. Jeff Danziger, Director of Human Resources, to come forward as he has prepared a few remarks this evening. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Paddock. Good evening, Superintendent Delgado, members of the Board of Education. Uh, we are so fortunate in FPS to have skilled, dedicated team members who play a variety of critical roles 
to support teaching and learning, whether it's making sure our students get to and from school safely, keeping our schools clean and well-maintained, assisting students and teachers with classroom needs, preparing and serving meals, or being a welcome and helpful presence in our offices. The work of our support staff is vital in making sure students, families, and colleagues have what's needed for teaching and learning. This year, we had over a dozen nominations for Support Person of the Year, which speaks to how valued our support staff is by their colleagues. And it gives me great pleasure to share that from this very competitive pool, this year's Farmington Support Person of the Year is Sarah Kearns, our wonderful office clerk at the Farmington Early Childhood Center. Sarah has worked with the Early Childhood Office team since she joined FPS in 2016, and Sarah's early childhood colleagues cannot say enough about all she does for so many. Teacher Tanya Rintz describes Sarah as a wonderful person who wears many hats and who is thoughtful, attentive, calm, friendly to parents, children, and staff, and Sarah is always there to lend a hand whenever you need something, is loyal, knowledgeable, caring, dedicated, gets along with others, and gets things done. Early Childhood Center PTA President Brittany Linville says that support is an understatement in describing Sarah, and that Sarah has been her lifeline during her years as PTA president. Sarah helps at every event. She's a tech wizard, is a friendly face in the front office who can answer almost every question that comes her way from parents, and works hard to put a smile on everyone's face when they come in for the day. In nominating Sarah, Kirsten Cicella, our, Cicella, sorry, our wonderful early childhood supervisor, submitted a list of all that Sarah does, and if I went through it, it'd keep us here all night. <laughs> early childhood comes with unique considerations from enrollment to budgeting to transportation to scheduling, and Sarah's gone above her job description to learn about all of these areas. She's even been helping run the bus loop and is a magician with substitute coverage. <laughs> this year, those of us in HR know that is not an easy trick. This year, Sarah has provided additional support with staff out on leave, and as Kirsten says, Sarah is a true asset to FPS who makes everyone around her better, makes her school better, and makes our community better. Um, and the recognition that Sarah gets from her adult colleagues is nothing compared to the love our youngest learners have for her. When some of us went to surprise Sarah, we entered a gym ringed with three and four year olds. <laughs> and when Kirsten asked them questions about who helps them in so many ways, the answer was always a shouted, Miss Sarah. <laughs> and if all this weren't enough, Sarah's a certified babysitter's training instructor and first aid CPR AED instructor and shares that expertise by training district staff and conducting trainings for the city of Farmington Hills. Sarah also serves the city of Farmington Hills as a special events coordinator, so her early childhood students and colleagues and families see her out in the community like at the daddy-daughter dance. Sarah, thank you for all you do for so many, and it's our pleasure to recognize you as Farmington's 2024 Support Person of the Year. I just want to thank everybody for this wonderful um, honor that I got. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Danziger, and congratulations, Sarah. Our first teacher honoree is Elementary Teacher of the Year, Ms. Gerilyn Shade from Gill Elementary. Gerilyn, please come. <laughs> Thank you. 
Jerry was nominated as elementary school teacher of the year by her colleagues, students, and FPS parents for her warm and nurturing nature and her ability to motivate her students. In the classroom, Ms. Shade has the ability to make learning fun, interactive, and ensuring that each of her students feel valued and involved at all times. Her classroom is a safe space for students where they feel comfortable to take risks, be themselves, and evolve as learners. Jerry goes above and beyond to create a dynamic and inclusive classroom environment where all, feel, all students feel comfortable and excited to participate. In her role as a resource room teacher, she looks for ways to best reach each student and help them achieve their personalized goals. She closely monitors progress to adjust her teaching strategies as needed to make sure the students are moving in the right direction. Jerry has an amazing ability to effectively work with students in crisis or distress. She has a natural calmness about her that translates to her classroom, students, and in all stressful situations. She is viewed as a safe place for so many students throughout the Gill Elementary School community. It's no secret that Ms. Shade is favored among her students and her colleagues, but she is also a favorite amongst parents. She regularly makes phone calls to, to comfort and console worried or concerned parents, as well as to celebrate the students' successes. She takes the time to stop and make sure that families feel heard and represented all the time. We have all had that one teacher, the one we remember the most, the one that took extra interest on us, was extra kind and supportive, said a district parent. Perhaps pushed us to be our very best self, even if we didn't appreciate it all the time. The one that made a difference. I remember mine, and I bet you remember yours too. Geraldine Shade is that kind of teacher, and for my son and my family, she made all the difference, said that parent. In addition to our FPS Elementary Teacher of the Year honor, Ms. Shade was also awarded $2,500 from the Suburban Collection. Later, she will be entered into a raffle with surrounding district's Teachers of the Year for a chance to win a lease of a brand new car. Jerry gives 100% each day to foster a culture of excellence and encourage her encourages her students to reach their full potential, said a teacher colleague at Gill. She went on to write, Jerry demonstrates kindness and empathy on a daily basis and always has a warm smile to share. She is always willing to lend a helping hand with school communities and go above and beyond to support the Gill community. She is truly a gift and a valued member of our school. Congratulations, Jerry, and thank you for being uh, what you, thank you for your presence you bring to Gill Elementary each and every day, and of course, the Greater Farmington Public Schools. At this time, I'd ask you to be congratulated by the Board of Education and Dr. Delgado. Say a few things. Yes. Okay. Do. You want to stand over there, right in the center? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this has truly been an honor, and something I wish to share with my Gill family. Um, we have amazing families at Gill School. Amazing kids. They're funny. They're smart. They're genius. They're silly. And um, also our teachers, the teachers that I work with back there, Carolyn and uh, Aaron and Renee and Kate and um, all those people that spend time listening to each other, problem solving together, laughing, sometimes crying together, but holding each other up. And last but definitely not least is our leader, Chris. Um, she's the leader of our family. She sees the best in all of us. She's our cheerleader, encourages us to think big. I'm truly grateful to be part of that family um, and to share that award, this, this award with them as well. Thank you. Our next nominee is Middle School Teacher of the Year, Ms. Cheryl Dalton from Warner Middle School. Yeah. 
Cheryl Dalton was nominated as Middle School Teacher of the Year by several current and retired teachers who wrote statements of support for Mrs. Dalton because she is valued and loved in the Warner community. She is engaging, approachable, and has relationship building skills in the classroom. She spent her entire teaching career with FPS in the Warner Middle School building and has been teaching middle schoolers for more than 25 years. Every day, students are excited to walk into Mrs. Dalton's classroom. Her students know that they can expect something great planned for the day as she makes her lessons come alive each and every day. Her students love learning in her classroom for that reason. What sets Cheryl apart from others is that she differentiates instruction every day, every hour, and in every one of her classrooms. She knows her students inside and out and will use a variety of teaching methods tailored to that specific group of students. She uses practices ranging from video, engaging text, conversations, hands-on learning, even movement around the classroom and the entire school building. Ms. Dalton could tell you each student's learning style and love language because she knows them that well, said a, a Warner teacher colleague. She pushes her students to work beyond what they think they are capable of. And while creating an environment that is all at the same time, while creating an environment that is safe, warm, and invites learning for all. Cheryl's classroom environment is positive and is a safe place for students. She strives to make her classroom inclusive for all. She consciously makes an effort to include all students in every single lesson. She makes it a point to connect the curriculum to students' personal lives, which keeps the students engaged and wanting to learn more. She, sh she shares her passion for history and reading with her students and inspires them to follow their own passions. I love to do creative writing, and Mrs. Dalton was always there to help me whenever I needed help, even though it was not part of her classroom assignments, said a former student of Mrs. Dalton's. She helped me develop my love of writing, and she even helped me, f helped me the following year when I was in seventh grade, and my short story was even published because of my relationship with Mrs. Dalton and her help. Cheryl, congratulations, and thank you for the positive relationships you build with our middle-level learners and the gift of your presence for more than 25 years at Warner Middle School. At this time, I would ask you to approach the board and Superintendent Delgado to be congratulated. Thank you. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Our final nominee for this evening is our high school teacher of the year, Ms. Kirsten Gentry from Farmington High School. Ms. Gentry was nominated as High School Teacher of the Year by her colleagues and students for her exceptional commitment to provide the best possible education for students and her de dedication to being a strong advocate for her colleagues. Ms. Gentry teaches 9th grade biology, 10th and 11th grade AP biology, and 10th, 11th, and 12th grade uh, um, anatomy at Farmington High. She has been teaching for more than 20 years in various science-related subjects such as biology, anatomy, and physiology. Ms. Gentry prides herself on making sure her students are successful in all that they do. Her students experience high levels of peer-to-peer -peer engagement, teacher-to-student engagement, and, and student-to-content engagement. Her dedication to student success goes beyond academics. She is a role model who demonstrates values of resilience, integrity, and empathy. She ha also has strong relationships with counselors and school social workers in the building so she can work collaboratively with them to serve the best for the whole child. Kirsten has always been active in extracurriculars as well at Farmington High. She was the varsity cheerleading coach for many years, followed by being the assistant track coach. She has been a class sponsor numerous times. She has spent time overseeing student groups, such as student council, and has been a link leader uh, sponsor for many years. Additionally, she has taught leadership classes to help students learn to be leaders as they grow. 
Any student at Farmington High School that has had Miss Gentry as a science teacher knows that she puts in a great amount of dedication and hard work to set up her students for success, said a former student. In addition to academic, academic success, Mrs. Gentry has also helped me shape my love for the sciences into a future career path. Among her colleagues, Kirsten is beyond admired. She serves as a building union representative and, and strongly advocates for her teachers in her building. She is respected by colleagues across all departments for her work ethic and her commitment to students and the needs of her colleagues. She serves as a mentor to many of her colleagues, especially the new teachers. Over the years, she has worked closely with building and district leadership teams to develop, implement, and adjust many science curriculums through the years. Her dedication, passion, and drive is exactly why Kirsten Gentry was named the High School Teacher of the Year for 23-24. Cheryl, congratulations, and thank you for the positive relationships you build with the staff and students at FHS. At this time, please congratulate yourself. I just, I, I've been continually blown away by this. Um, so I just want to say thank you. It has been an amazing career and I am inspired every single year by my students and my colleagues and the support of parents that we have in this community. And I consider myself very lucky. So thank you. As we conclude this presentation for this evening, I want our audience to know that each individual recognized tonight will have their name engraved on a plaque that will remain on the walls at the central office to, re to be remembered forever as an FPS support person, teacher of the year, which is this one, um, as well as the teacher of the year. So this is a very, very big honor that will stay with the district forever. A special thank you to the families that came out tonight to be with our honorees. Your support certainly provides um, them to be their very best for our Farmington Public Schools uh, students. Thank you to Dr. Delgado, the entire Board of Education for allowing us to present tonight the, this, these special um, honorees as, as wonderful, wonderful people in this district. Of course, a special thank you to all of the folks that have helped me uh, get the, tonight ready, the school community relations department, the food service team, my, my colleagues in the HR department for making this evening so special. And um, once again, congratulations to all the honorees tonight. Thank you so much. Without further ado, we'll keep the recognition going. Again, we will take a 10 minute recess at the end of the winter sports recognition so we can congratulate all of you, both our teachers as well as our students and coaches. So I'd like to welcome up to the podium our Director of Safety and Athletics, Ms. Allison Robinson, who has our athletic coordinators with her, Ms. Stacy Punzel from North Farmington High School and Mr. Mike Cahill from Farmington High School. Mrs. Yes. Robinson. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I am proud to be here uh, as one person on behalf of Farmington Athletics. Although I have not been in this position for very long, I can tell you that the athletic tradition here is strong and the talent is real. Um, I, I'm pleased to be through my first season and we've had so many wonderful athletic performances by our student athletes. We have state champions, we have state champion runners up, um, league champions, district champions, um, and a lot of individual accomplishments. So I'm very excited to be here tonight to, to celebrate all of those. Um, and as Dr. Delgado mentioned, uh, we brought with us our two athletic coordinators who I want to give a shout out to, um, Ms. Stacy Punzel from North, Mr. Mike Cahill from Farmington High School. Um, yes, please. <laughs> 
They are the boots on the ground, as I like to call them for, for athletics, know everything that's going on, um, handle you know various situations, make sure our athletes and our coaches get what they need, and I can tell you that I could never do my job without them, so um, I appreciate working with both of you. Um, and, and I also want to say, as much as this is absolutely for our student athletes tonight, I want to give a shout out to all of our coaches that are here um, this evening, their time, their dedication, the various ways that they serve as role models, the ways that they uplift our students. Um, I, you know, we, we can't even count all the ways that, that they help our kids. Um, and it's a really important part of um, our students' experience. So I just want to say if we can give a round of applause to all of our coaches who work so hard for our kids. So we do have um, a lot of honorees tonight, which is very exciting. Um, and so the, the order tonight, we're going to start with Farmington High School and go through their teams. Mr. Cahill will introduce each coach who will present his awards. Um, students, when your names are called to, come on up front here. And then we can always do a quick picture at the end of each team. Uh, after that, we'll go with uh, North Farmington Athletics, and then we'll do our United teams at the end. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Mike Cahill. I guess, no, I'm, I'll, I'll click it. That's okay. okay, thank you all for coming today. We are uh, happy to be here, and thank you for coming and celebrating our student athletes and coaches as well. Uh, we had a really exciting uh, winter season at Farmington High. We welcomed in new leadership in both our boys and girls basketball programs, and Coach Byron Johnson for the boys and Natalie Nowak for the girls. And we could not be happier with the culture we see them establishing and the growth um, and progress we saw in just one year. I'm really, really confident that the, the future is bright in both of these programs, and we're lucky to have them. Um, in wrestling, uh, under the second year leadership of Coach Ben Joswiak, uh, they put a banner up on the wall with the district championship, so way to go wrestling. Um, and last but not least, our boys uh, swim and dive team. Um, I've been told, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this was the greatest swim and dive season in the history of Farmington High School. Uh, go, yeah. And I had to double check, that goes back to 1888. I don't know about the swim team back then, but hey, we'll, uh, we'll take it. Um, and so that was under uh, leadership of coach Drew Hans, and they finished one point uh, away from the state championship, went down to the last race, um, but a lot of really uh, impressive accolades for their, for their student athletes. So um, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, coach Byron Johnson from the boys basketball program to come on up and give the boys basketball awards. Thank you. Um, I'm Byron Johnson, a boys varsity head coach. Uh, I had the privilege of being selected as the coach this year, our first year. Um, I think we were 12 and 11, 12 and 11 as a team. We finished, uh, had a great group of uh, kids. Um, we were very, very young. Uh, we had three all league players, uh, two of which that were sophomores and one of uh, which that was a freshman. So uh, the future definitely looks bright. Uh, first, we had uh, Greg Graves. Uh, Greg led us in scoring uh, all year. I think he averaged about 22 points a game. Uh, he's a two-year varsity player. Um, he started every game except for when he got hurt at the end, and, uh, and we didn't finish as well as we wanted to, but he was our leading scorer all year. Uh, Greg, I don't, I don't see Greg here. Okay, uh, second, we had uh, Randy Rice, who was also a sophomore. Uh, Randy was our best uh, defensive player. He was selected by the uh, coaches as the uh, uh, best defensive player. He had the job of guarding the other team's best uh, offensive player all year. Um, Randy is also only in his second year. Uh, this is his first year on varsity, and uh, he was also an all-league player. And I don't see Randy here. And then lastly, we had uh, Malik Bush. Uh, Malik was a freshman. Um, he actually played varsity and junior varsity, um, so he logged a lot of minutes this year. Uh, when our leading scorer got hurt towards the end of the year, uh, Malik stepped right into that role and, and did not miss a beat. So, uh, good job. Thanks.
don't be shy, parents, to get up here and get your pictures. Okay, next up, I'd like to welcome to the mic, Coach Natalie Nowak for the girls' basketball. I always have to put the microphone way down, so. Um, my name is Natalie Nowak, uh, teacher at Farmington High School, and then this past season um, was my first year taking over the girls' varsity program. Um, so coming into this year, we knew that uh, the team prior to us, uh, Class 2023 graduated a large group of very talented seniors. Um, so we were gonna have uh, much of a rebuild to do. So our varsity team this year consisted of 16 girls, 11 of them which had never played on the varsity level. Um, so super, super proud of our kids for just working hard all year, never giving up. Um, one very special member of that team uh, is freshman Sydney Nogas. I don't know if you wanna come up here. Come on. <laughs> Um, so making varsity as a freshman is a very, very special accomplishment, and not only did she excel in that, um, multiple times throughout the year she was our leading scorer, um, our big three-point shooter, which is very impressive as a freshman. Um, she started every single game as a freshman, um, clocked many, many, many minutes. There were many times when she'd ask for a sub, and I'd pretend like I didn't hear her, because she'd just be like, you're good, stay in. So um, she overcome a lot of challenges and just kind of jumped into a role that even if she wasn't ready for, um, just handled it, um, did a really, really, really great job. So her, along with some of the other young members of our team, we're very excited to keep building, um, and I'm excited to see her future. Congrats. All right, next up, representing Boys Swim, Coach Drew Hans. All right, thank you. Um, yes, this was our, uh, our best year. Um, I've been here for about 10 years. Um, I've been coaching for about 30, and um, there's always like three things that you want to try and do in high school swim. Number one, Stay in like the OAA Red, which is that top league for next year. And we did, so that was great. Um, try and get a trophy at state meet. We've, we don't have one in our case until this year. We brought home the second place one, one point away from the first, so that was cool. Uh, but the most important thing is, is getting all these groups of kids together that come from different backgrounds of swim. Either they've been swimming all their life or they've you know just started as seniors in high school to go out for the swim team. And you know, they're swimming heads up with their holding their breath. And then three weeks later, they're doing the four competitive strokes. Um, they all got along this year. And um, they, were, they were pulling for each other. They were pushing each other. And um, they put their phones away, which was a big part of it. <laughs> they weren't allowed to use their phones at practice, before, after, and then at swim meet. So that was a really big thing. And, um, it would be really great if like that whole no phone thing could happen in school too because that way I wouldn't have to take it away. But they really liked it after a while as they were talking to each other and stuff. So it was cool. Five of the uh, seven boys that uh, were all league, all state are here tonight. And uh, I'm going to bring up those boys now. Um, junior uh, Luke Warden, all league, all state. Uh, senior Leland Karanovic. <laughs> Junior Paul DiMartini.
sophomore Josh Luo. And junior Jack Tomlinson. Uh, yeah, these boys uh, broke team records. Um, some of them were a, a part of the uh, 200 free state championship relay. And uh, like I said, they were all, all league and all state. Um, so it was a pretty impressive group. Good job, boys. All right, one last thing. We know Coach isn't going to love this, but we would like to honor Coach Hans, who was um, honored as the State Coach of the Year. So congratulations. <laughs> Okay, last but not least, uh, Coach Ben Josiak with the wrestling program. Uh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Coach Ben Josiak. Uh, I, um, this is my second year. Uh, I cannot tell you how much every fall, summer, spring, I look forward to winter just so I get to, to work with these kids, um, to go out there and compete. It's, it's, you know, it's just, it's, I feel so blessed that I get to do this. Um, tonight we're going to be honoring uh, some uh, all-league and league champion, um, but really everyone on the team deserves to be honored tonight, and um, to go uh, with the year we've had to be district champions is just, it's, it, again, I, I'm still in shock. Not really, but, you know, it feels real good. Um, so to start, uh, um, our, our sole league champion tonight, uh, Jacob McKimmons, he's a junior. Um, we're looking to see great things out of him next year, too. Jacob, come on. Get our next wrestler, um, our Lady Falcon captain, probably pound for pound toughest one on the team, Ella Barron. Tally here? Yep. Oh, there you are. <clears throat> our next one, our senior captain, Tally Copernan. And uh, next, I want to call up everyone who, who came here to uh, be recognized for being district champions tonight. Uh, Well, our last, our last all league member was uh, Junior Ian Letterman. Oh, I give you two. Well, hey. now everyone else come up. Emmett, James, let's get a picture. All the wrestlers, come on up.
Okay, thank you again for coming and uh, honoring these athletes and coaches. Uh, I'll now pass it off to North Farmington Athletic Coordinator, Stacy Punzel. Good evening, and thank you for having me here tonight. That, that's a hard act to follow. Wow. But I think at North Farmington, we have the same kind of accolades that we can celebrate tonight as well. Um, we have some, some different things uh, going on. We have um, the bowling team with the last three out of four years in the OAA white division. Uh, so they were division champs. We had an all-new girls basketball staff, just like Farmington, uh, after a decade of Jeff Simpson and his staff. So that was exciting, seeing new people taking over. Uh, we had our first ever female all-state wrestler, and our gymnastics team was state runner-up. And to cap it off, we had very narrowly a state runner-up in Division I basketball this year. So those are our exciting overviews. Uh, and One, one other program, our ski team, our unified ski team, doubled its uh, team capacity this year. We had over 30 uh, skiers this year. So that was really incredible. Brand new skiers and some experienced skiers as well. So um, everything is looking uh, pretty good on our side of town. So I would like to uh, start with boys basketball, who our head coach could not be here tonight. Uh, Todd Negotian had quite a few accolades this year. He was the OAA Red Division Coach of the Year, the All Area Coach of the Year, and I believe the AP Coach of the Year is a state level award as well. So uh, Todd had many, many accolades and led his team to <laughs> runner up this year. I like these slides, this is helpful. All right, so. We have uh, Tyler Spratt, Landon Williams, uh, Dylan Smith, and Rob Smith, uh, four of the five starting uh, basketball team as all division. And we had, they are not here tonight, any of the boys? I didn't see any of the boys sitting out here tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and just read it right off the screen. So Tyler, all division, uh, he was the all area co-player of the year, um, an AP all state first team, an all metro north team. I saw that posted maybe two days ago, so that was, that's pretty exciting. Uh, and Tyler will play at Cleveland State in uh, uh, Ohio next year. Uh, Landon Williams, uh, all division, all area co-player of the year, and all team, uh, AP all state second team. He is slated to play at Niagara University in New York uh, next year. So we have two division one uh, players. Uh, Dylan Smith is all division and all area second team. And Rob Smith, who was a transfer student, but a hometown boy, um, all division and all area first team. So that is, uh, the, the accolades are amazing. Uh, the team was the OAA all uh, division winner, the district winner, and the regional winner as well. So very, very exciting for our school, uh, traveling to Lansing this year for the state championships. So we were almost there, we were this close, but um, it wasn't meant to be, so I won't mention. I won't mention the Catholic school thing, so. <laughs> I had to, but. Uh, so congratulations to the boys um, basketball team from North Farmington. <laughs> ah, and here they are. So to represent our girls basketball team this year is, uh, for tonight, is Eric Kitt. He is our new JV coach. So Eric, come on up. Oh man. Um, this is my first year. My name is Eric Kidd. Um, it's a pleasure coaching these girls this year. Um, we got three seniors, um, Aja Jahar, Hannah Hart, and Naj Bradley. Um, amazing athlete, amazing. Um, Aja, she was the most um, best offense player of the year. Hannah Hart, she brought the energy. And um, Naj Bradley, she does kept the team together with her defense and this telling us, hey, they stick together. Um, like I said, this is um, my first year, Coach Mike and Coach Mar, first year, and we got seven seniors leaving, so we're rebuilding. But we got a good freshman and sophomore class coming up, and uh, it's gonna be a bright future at North Farmington. And um, I know none of them here right now, but I don't tell them congratulations for the hard job they did this year. And um, they got a new journey of life starting, and I'm proud of, I'm proud of each and every one of them. Thank you.
All right, our next coach here tonight to talk about his program is Bobby Matheson. He is our wrestling coach. Where are you, Bobby? There you go. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Coach Robert Matheson. This is going on my eighth year, I believe, as head coach between starting at Harrison High School and then after closing there here at North Farmington. Um, before I get going, do I got any of my kids in the building? Going once and twice? No, not tonight. Um, so this year has been an exceptionally special year for a couple of reasons. Um, we were a very young team. We had no senior wrestlers on the team this year. And it was pretty much evenly split between freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Um, so a very young and relatively green team really, really uh, stuck it out through thick and thin in a lot of ways and put in a lot of work and had a really impressive season. Um, a lot of freshmen that had standout seasons, which is particularly special for being a freshman at varsity wrestling. Um, and also, I want to make sure that I mention um, we had a great, one of the best um, teams of parents that I've had in any wrestling program in a very long time, in fact, at all. So I'm really appreciative, really appreciative for them. Um, we, had, we had two uh, league champions, two league runner-ups, and one fourth place at the league tournament. Um, we had one uh, first um, in the area. The Observer Land Wrestling Tournament is regarded as the best in area. Each champion is considered that, and we had one of those. Um, and we had a couple of county placers as well, but um, tonight the most notable uh, accomplishment is Miss Lorelai Shrum. She is a junior. She wrestled her freshman year. She wrestled in middle school for a couple of years. Um, she took her sophomore season off, um, and so she was. She came back with a little bit of ring rust, as you might say, um, and she had an outstanding season, battled through a couple of injuries, and as you can only hope for um, every one of your kids that has aspirations of performing well at the end of the season, Lorelai absolutely um, performed to her best ability and peaked when it really mattered and uh, came out with a sixth place finish at the girls, in the girls division at the state meet. Um, so congratulations to Lorelai and all of our uh, wrestlers um, who are going to be doing a whole lot of uh, off-season wrestling camps and clinics and tournaments um, and freestyle and Greco wrestling rule sets to uh, prep themselves even better to have an even better ne better year next year. Uh, congrats to Lorelai again, all the kids, and thanks again to all of the parents and all of the, uh, the rest of the staff and athletics for helping us all make this a successful year. All right, our next coach I'd like to introduce is Dwayne Anderson. He's our head coach of our boys and girls teams. And I do believe we have Jack here tonight. Come on up, Jack. Thank you, board. Thank you, community. I think this is my seventh year coaching at North with bowling. And um, we've been division champs the last three out of four years. So. I want to give a good shout to all the teams who's not here for continuing our success. One of our bowlers here, Jack, got his name spelled wrong, but <laughs> we had a couple of boys who made it to an all-first team, as you can see on the board, Joshua Brenner, who also plays uh, baseball. He couldn't be here today because they have a, they have a match today. He was an all-first team. Jack was um, our second all, all team. Jack also was one of the only persons on the team to make it to, reach, uh, make it to states this year. So let's give a congratulations to Jack for making it all the way to states. So another one of the things that we do with bowling, bowling is, as you know, is a nationwide competition. And uh, we have this thing called Junior Gold. And Junior Gold is, uh, U12, U14, U16, U18, and U20 youths from all over the country, they come and they bowl in the Junior Gold uh, tournaments. The Junior Gold is going to be held this year here in Michigan. And so Jack just re, um, was in a tournament and he qualified to bowl in the Junior Gold as well. So I want to congratulate him for that.
So this other award is for, is for Josh, but like I said, Josh also plays baseball, and uh, he's not able to be here today. Just a side note that of our seven boys that are bowling, six of them are graduating this year, so we're hoping to continue our winning, uh, winning tradition with promoting a lot of our JV boys into varsity next year. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Okay, to conclude, we have our two United programs. <laughs> Let's go. Now, we're going to welcome up. While they're walking up here, I want to hype them just for a second that we have uh, Coach Jeff Dwyer and the powerhouse Farmington United Gymnastics Program. Uh, now, Coach, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was considered going into the year kind of a rebuilding maybe. Were you fifth ranked going into the, something like that? Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> And I'll let him tell you how it, how it turned out. No spoilers, uh, how, the, uh, how the tournament turned out. So, Jeff Dwyer. So, hi. Um, first of all, I want to thank you guys because we are not able to um, practice at either of the high schools. And I appreciate, I know it goes into putting us in a couple of clubs throughout the year. So, I appreciate that. And I thank you guys for supporting us that way. Um, so girls, they don't want to look at me. Come on up front, okay? So last year, um, I want to introduce Nicole Dale and Amanda Lumley. Also, they help coach Um, last year, we were third in the state, and we graduated four seniors, so you, you were right. It was supposedly a, a rebuilding year, but um, that wasn't in the plans for these guys. And so they had a lot of people st stepped up to the plate. I will say this, last you know, April, the girls had a goal. They wanted to be one of the best teams in the state, and they are, okay? <laughs> They were, um, I guess, our season came down to losing the state championship with .1 seconds left, and someone drains a three-pointer, and we lose by a point. So we lost by two-tenths of a point, to, and that's a, a bent knee. Um, so I'm sure each of the girls blamed themselves when they got home. <laughs> but you can't do that. It was, it was an awesome experience. Um, we, we really killed it, and we had the best meet I think that we could have had and it just went um, two tenths less than what we wanted. But it was quite the honor. Um, what you see up, so we were state runner up, so that's why I wanted all the girls to uh, come up here because they're a big part of the team. This program's been successful um, because of student athletes like these guys. And if you can get good coaches with you and good athletes, um, and you put your minds to something, good things happen. And I, I can't tell you guys how much I appreciate all of that, all the work and effort that you guys put in this year. Um, so real quick, just go down and say your name. Yeah? <laughs> Starting with Jaden. And if you look up on the board there, um, if you were all state, so to be all state, there's a couple girls missing up there. Um, there's a couple more slides. Well, I can click it. Okay. All right, so go back to that first one. Um, so to be all state at state meet, you have to be in the top 10 in that particular event. So, Sophia, raise your hand real quick again. Allstate, Elena, Bella, Ayla, Aubrey, and Leah. So,
So I want to brag some more. So the three girls that were all state in the all around, so when you take all four events and you add them up, that's the truest sign of a gymnast. And you'll see that in the Olympics, right, this summer. So um, Sophia, Bella, and Elena, um, step forward a little bit. So these three, <laughs> now, I mean, because we were well represented at the state meet, there was no team that had three girls in the top 10 um, at the state competition. So that was a huge credit to you guys. Very proud of you. And then Aubrey, if you could step forward. So Aubrey, as a sophomore, just nonchalantly wins the uneven bar championship. So she was all state. And then last is uh, Leah Hodge. She's a junior. Um, Leah just tore it up. She was all state in every event. She was first on, um, was it Beam? I know, you won everything. Okay, bars. <laughs> And then she, but most importantly, she won the all-around competition, Division I, best gymnast in the state, 9.5 average on every event, and she just killed it, knocked it out of the park. So if you guys could just turn and say thank you, I'll give you your awards um, back there. But just say thank you to the board. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, and our final uh, team being honored tonight is the Farmington United Hockey Team. And I want to say a real quick thing about them, that uh, I have a personal uh, connection with them, that they're coached by Anthony Leitz, who I taught and coached in lacrosse way back in the day. Um, and he has taken over the program, um, I want to say fourth year, is that right, Coach? Going on the fourth, all right. And every year they have made significant growth each year, culminating this year uh, in a, uh, a triple overtime, correct? Triple overtime playoff uh, victory, which was the first playoff win for the program in seven years, right? So, Coach Anthony Leeds. I'm gonna try to get us out of here. Um, Couple shout outs on Mr. Danziger, AP World was a blast back in the day. Uh, Mr. Dwyer, uh, 15 years later, I'm still bummed we didn't go to the zoo for zoology, it got rained out, so. Um, and then Coach Cahill, um, getting the fear of God in English class, making sure I was behaving was, was always great, because back in lacrosse we could kick it back and have fun, so. Um, to the board, thank you for having us, it means a lot, taking out time of your busy days. And then all the other coaches, um, it's cool. It's cool to see all the, you know, the ups and downs, high school sports. It's pretty vicious, that cycle. We had a really good senior group this year. Um, They're basically my freshman 2.0. When I first got the job, they were going into their um, sophomore year. So this year, coaching was a little bit emotional. We had a lot of good leaders in that group. Um, and it was just overall a great year. Like Coach Cahill said, every year it's kind of gotten better. Um, we have Michael Beals here today, so I'll have him come up with me. He's our only representative, so he can uh, come hang out. Can I click it or will it? Okay. Let's do the arrow too. Okay, either. Where's the arrow? Oh, right here. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, we'll just go in order here. Ryan Elnich, uh, it's been crazy kind of uh, where he's come and what he can do for a program. And, and hockey, especially in Farmington, right, we compete with some of those, those private schools down the road and stuff like that. And uh, when he decided to, uh, you know, say goodbye to AAA and, and all that, he, he instantly made our program better. Uh, this year he was uh, all OAA. Um, he was a Division II All-State second team. He's, he's been the first guy nominated All-State um, in quite some time. He uh, was recognized as a Hobie Baker Character Award uh, nationally. 
Um, and then he's the all-time points leader uh, for Farmington United, I believe, with, I think he finished with 106. So he's our only guy to kind of be in that 100-point mark uh, since our time as being Farmington United. Um, Brady Brink, um, again, he's a sophomore. He was here last year. Um, you know, someone that's like the face of the program. He came in as a freshman, just tore it up, and this year he doubled his points. I think he had 55 and 23 games or something like that. And he was honorable mention for, for D2 All-State. And then little Owen Sims, you, you may or may not see him in the hallways. He's got a little stature, but he's mighty. He's, he's, he hangs with the best of them, and he's, he's a tough guy. And uh, he's, he's also just like Brady came in as a, as a younger guy and made a huge impact for us. Got Michael Beals here. Um, Michael's been with us since his freshman year, and he, he's come a long way. Um, Michael was nominated all OAA this year. Um, something to note, right, a lot of you guys may or may not watch the Red Wings, right? They have three goalies they kind of go through throughout the year. We had, we had Michael, right? So <laughs> Michael. You know, when you, when you think about it, right, he, he was our only guy. There was no coach, you know, I need help, coach, I need a break. There, there really was an opportunity for that, right? We didn't have another goaltender to back him up this year. Um, he saw a lot of shots in practice. You know, he played, I think, six or seven games pretty sick, um, similar to our women's basketball coach at Farmington. It's, you know, had to act like you didn't hear it sometimes, jokingly. Um, but anything we could do to support him in, in his role this year, uh, we tried our best to do, and, you know, he, he won 14 games for us this year as, as our only goaltender, and he really, you know, uh, stepped up big this year. Like I said, me, him, and his father met at the rink right before the season started, and, you know, just told him I believed in him, wrote him a little letter that's between us, and, um, you know, you did everything and more, and you really showed your commitment, and, um, you know, the boys, they definitely saw, and they appreciate it, and you made a huge, huge leaps um, of improvement for us, Mikey, so... Um, the next one is Curtis Kent. He was nominated an assistant captain this year. He was honorable mention all OAA. Um, we had fear that we were going to lose him to the bowling team. He's a pretty sick bowler. Um, I didn't think I could be annoyed bowling until I was placed next to him in his lane. He's just like tearing it up. So he may be splitting time next year with the bowling team because he's pretty gross. Um, <laughs> Palmer's probably got the best nickname of the boys. We call him Chipper, which is short for Chipotle. The kid put on like 50 pounds, 20, 20 pounds this off season. So um, he's quite the character. He came from Florida. I wish he was here. You, you'd understand, and the laughter would be great. The first time I met him, I said, hey, are you Anderson? He goes, yeah. What's up? I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so he's just great. He's a big glue guy, big team guy, you know, you, as, you know, people in education, it's always great to have, you know, those types of teachers in the hallways that kind of keep the mood light. So he's, he's definitely that for the boys when things kind of get serious and, and dialed in. You can always look to Palmer to put a smile on your face. So, and then Paul Elnich, um, he's a twin of Ryan. You know, Paul, he, he's been an assistant captain since his sophomore year. And sometimes athletically, you can kind of be in the shadows of the success that Ryan can do, but without Paul, you know, um, we don't have a mentor for some of our younger guys. We don't have a guy that, you know, will yes coach and, and do every little thing you ask him. So, um, like most of our guys, Paul, and these guys aren't, a lot of these other guys aren't here today. They, they do a lot of other, whether it's lacrosse, golf, soccer, um, they're doing a lot of other things, sports, work. So, um, it's been an awesome year. Um, our team, uh, was all state academic, so you know they definitely put the work in in the classroom. You know we had a couple team meetings this year, something we didn't really do in, in past years. I you know this year was kind of third third times a charm. Um, my third year, guys were really serious about their goals, right? We we set goals and realistic goals, and you know that was one of them. I wanted them to be you know um, you know good in the classroom. I didn't want them getting in trouble, right? I wanted them to kind of take care of their business and, and things like that. So to see them kind of get that team recognition all state was pretty cool to see. Um, one of our goals, we wanted to win the division. We came one game short um, on that. We played a good Bloomfield Hills team, so hopefully next year um, we can get them back. So our, our, like I said, our team's come a long way since the year I got them. Um, very proud of them. And I think that's it. Again, I want to thank all you guys um, for the guys that, you know, I don't get to see everyone in the, 
you know, stands at least not meet you, but even just the uh, fan involvement and community involvement, we've had a lot more people at our games, and, you know, that really does help the boys, and, um, you know, especially in those tough games, seeing you guys go crazy and absolute bonkers in the stands is, is huge. The boys love it, so keep that up next year. So thank you. We want to bring back uh, Coach Dwyer for an encore. Um, he has one more thing he wanted to uh, present. I live my life with post-it notes and I didn't have one here. But um, so Ayla, come on up here really quick because she was standing up here and I went through all five of them. She was also all state on the uneven bars and I would die if I didn't say anything to her. So give her a big. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. I, I want to say thank you again to all of our coaches for being here tonight for nurturing our athletes. I want to say thank you to our student athletes. Special shout out to our seniors. Um, thank you for the, you know, the wonderful career that you've had in Farmington schools, for bringing your talent here, for keeping your talent here. Um, and I want to thank our parents, too, as a parent of a varsity athlete myself. I know that they don't, <laughs> they don't get to where they are without your support. So thank you. Um, thanks to teachers, and thank you to the board for allowing us this opportunity. We appreciate it. Um, that was wonderful, so that you'll have a time to congratulate each other and take pictures. Um, we'll have a 10-minute recess, so 718 board members will reconvene. Thank you.
uh, if we could take our seats and board members, if you can come back to the board table, please. How's that for a bang? All right. Um, this meeting will reconvene at 720. We have um, items from the president, approval of agenda. Mr. Rich. I move that the Board of Education approve the April 9th, 2024 regular meeting agenda as presented. Second. A uh, motion by Mr. Rich, supported by Mrs. Weems, to approve the agenda. Um, voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Thank you. Uh, announcements? Um, thank you. Um, President Blau sends her regrets for not being here tonight. She's actually at a National School Board Association conference. Um, we thank you for your interest in attending or viewing our Farmington Public Schools Board of Education meetings. The Open Meetings Act requires that all meetings of the Board of Education be held in public. As a result, our board meetings are the only place and time that we as a board can legally work together on district matters. While these board meetings are held in public for the purpose of full transparency, they are not public meetings. While you are welcome to attend our board meetings in person or watch from elsewhere, we must take the time needed to address, discuss, and hear presentations on all matters of importance to our work for the district. We, the members of the Farmington Board of Education, together with our superintendent, agree to abide by the following standards of behavior when interacting with each other, both during our board meetings and elsewhere, even when we disagree with another's points of view. Um, the agreements are to listen actively, no sidebars, respect people and ideas, presume positive intent, use electronic devices respectfully and stay engaged, listen to learn, not to defend. Be brave and be vulnerable. We thank our community members for abiding by these standards of behaviors as well. Um, next on the agenda, we have items from the secretary. Thank you. The board has received communications regarding the IB program at Farmington High School and parliamentary procedure. The board acknowledges communications and responds when appropriate. A list of correspondence can be found in the board packet, accessible on the Farmington Public Schools website. Thank you. Um, next, we have legislative update. Mr. Rich. So the state legislature had gone on a brief recess. They have started to reconvene and are now looking at bringing different legislation forward. Um, and as that moves through committees and has more, uh, more structure to those bills, I'll be reporting out more. Okay, thank you. Um, district updates, Dr. Delgado. Thank you, Mrs. Heinrich. I have several things to share with everyone this evening. Uh, hope everyone had a restful spring break. We know that we're um, back for the home stretch of the school year. So best wishes to all of our students for their testing season. We had the ever important SAT uh, test today, as well as we have MSTEP, PSAT, and so many of the other tests uh, culminating in our AP and our IB examinations here in the spring. And so um, we know that they will uh, do their very best um, and represent us well. Wanted to uh, um, really highlight a wonderful day and really a risk that was taken by a school, uh, Kenbrook Elementary. Principal Ben Smith and his staff, uh, right before spring break, created a Friday day called the Profile of a Lifelong Learner Day. And together, uh, as a staff with their principal, they decided to really highlight, as you look at our posters, every single aspect of the learner profile. Um, the lifelong learner profile for their students. 
they already had an existing organization, uh, a structure of kindergarten through fifth graders. So it's a built-in mentorship opportunity where the students stay together for multiple years and they use those groups, those uh, kind of pods, if you will, to rotate them with their teachers um, ex exemplifying every aspect of the profile. And, uh, and the students were engaged in, in very hands-on activities to demonstrate the different aspects of compassionate community members, resiliency, problem solving, and the like. And so it was really, you know, we talk a lot about taking risks in school, and Principal Smith and his team decided to take a risk, and it was uh, a wonderful, purposeful day for our students, um, and really an authentic task. So I wanted to uh, thank Ken Brook, their entire staff, for their commitment to that. Also wanted to wish a Ramadan Mubarak to all of our uh, families who are um, finishing up the month of Ramadan. We know that tomorrow, Wednesday, is Eid al-Fitr, which ends the, when, they, when you break the fast. And so we know many of our students, our staff, our families are celebrating the holy month of Ramadan. And so we uh, wish them again Ramadan Mubarak. A couple other things, um, and in, in no order, I have many random things to share. But I wanted to recognize that once again, Farmington Public Schools has received the School District Award for Outstanding Financial Reporting. So, I received a letter that says, the Association of School Business Officials International is pleased to award Farmington Public Schools the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. ASBO International COE, the Certificate of Excellence, recognizes districts that have met the program's high standards for financial reporting and transparency. The school district earned the Certificate of Excellence for its annual comprehensive financial report, the ACFR, for the fiscal year ended 2023. And if you come to central office and you walk down our hall, you will pass dozens of these kind of awards. This is yet another one. Uh, thank you to our Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, Jennifer Kaminsky, her incredible team for keeping this district in really excellent um, financial repair. So uh, thank you, Jen, and, and your team. Also wanted to uh, mention that the Educational Foundation has several scholarships available for our young people. So this is the season for scholarship applications. They've already received about 70 valid applications, meaning that all components have been submitted. Uh, they have about 142 students who have draft submission, um, but there are nine scholarships that don't have a single submission. So many of these scholarships, it's free money for our students from our Ed Foundation, and we want to encourage all of our families watching to encourage your a child to apply for these. Some of them, just as an example, we have the Elks um, uh, scholarship that actually the Elks scholarship is for students not seeking a four-year degree and sometimes that student group gets overlooked and, and they're not even aware that that uh, applies. We have scholarships from the Garden Club, from the uh, Farmington Education Association, um, from all of our schools, from the Warnerettes, uh, Miss Weems scholarship. You have 25 applicants so you'll have to make some decisions here. Uh, Beachview, <laughs> Steam, the Hackbots, um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Heisch has a scholarship, our former superintendent, and on and on. So please uh, check out the scholarship website on our Ed Foundation. Encourage your young person to apply. There are scholarships that are waiting for you. Next on, the Hackbots. I had the uh, supreme honor to go to Saginaw Valley State last Friday and spend the better part of a day watching our students in the state competition. Well, they did it again, folks. Three years in a row, they're in the World Championship Nationals in Houston, Texas. So the Hackbots, first of all, um, competed wonderfully and so collaboratively. They officially qualified for Worlds. They'll be traveling to Houston next week, April 16th to 21st. It will be the third consecutive competition at Worlds. But equally important is uh, worth noting is that they earned the Sustainability Award at the state level. This award celebrates and recognizes a team which has developed sustainable practices to have a positive environmental impact and achieve long-term continuity. And state levels are worth three times the points at the district level. So officially they ranked 71st out of 622 teams in the state and did an excellent, excellent job. And just. Um, to reiterate the fact of the of the hackbots, robotics is is the type of activity that welcomes all. We have students from all um, different uh, levels, different ages, different abilities, and they all find a way to contribute to the overall success of the program. Whether they're doing the actual mechanical or electrical engineering, or they're working on graphics or marketing, um, or um, or communication, there's uh, there's space for everyone in robotics, and so we're really proud of all of our teams. Next up. Uh, if you're thinking about a spring uh, musical, how about checking out the 50s rock musical Grease? 
It was 1972 when the show featuring greasers and written about the complexities of peer pressure, personal core values, and love hit, uh, love hit Broadway. It's now 52 years later, and the story still resonates with teens. Of course, the movie added some songs that weren't in the original stage musical, but this Farmington High School production will show you that Danny, played by Nate Zerbonia, Sandy, Allison Hosington, Rizzo, played by Olivia Campbell, Kanicki, Merrick Partridge, Frenchy, Shreya Mishra, Duty, Michael Patterson, Marty, Allison Bailing, Sonny, Donovan Sharp, Jan, Elise Bowdry, and Roger, played by Zach Burns Pavlik, are still shaken at the high school hop, and Grease Lightning carried them there. So mark your calendars for April 18th, 19th, and 20th at 7.30. All tickets are general seating, $12 for students and senior adults 60 plus, $15 for adults. So we hope that you'll be able to join Farmington High School's presentation of Greece. And last but not least, I want to just give an update. We know we spent considerable time here at the board level as well as in public uh, meetings talking about our commitment to um, improving our, our not only our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, but looking at some of the recent incidents and how we can find improvement. I want to thank our uh, human resources team with the leadership of Mr. Brad Paddock, as well as Allison Robinson, our director of athletics, for making marked improvements to our onboarding process. So um, two significant things have come out of these conversations. The creation of a memo that is uh, being distributed um, to staff that explicitly, in part of the onboarding, speaks to our expectations as a school district with adults' use of any kind of racially insensitive language, and essentially a prohibition on any of that. It talks about, in, in short form, it is imperative to understand that the use of racially insensitive language, whether intentional or unintentional, has no place in our school community. Part of this comment in this memo references the policies that we already have and the statements that we already have. I know that Mr. Walker is not here, but we'll continue those conversations with his leadership of the policy committee. But the memo itself references the fact that in our own vision statement, we talk about working together with our diverse community and celebrating that. In our culture statement, we talk about being inclusive and respecting everybody, and that we, in our culture statement, our own culture statement, we talk about modeling civility in our language and our actions. And so, uh, clearly, that aligns with this, uh, this, this real explicit deliberation um, or, or um, you know, documentation that this, these are our belief statements. In addition, this memo references our existing policy. There has been suggestion that we need or don't have an equity policy. Couldn't be further from the truth. We do have an equity policy. It's board policy 3010. It's an equity and excellence policy that provides that the school district commits to achieving equity and excellence for every student and goes on and on to talk about our celebration and commitment to diversity. In addition, board policy 8008 talks about discrimination and harassment policies and how our Board of Education is committed to maintaining a learning and working environment in which all individuals are treated with dignity and respect, free from discrimination and harassment. Those, so those already existed, and part of this is to explicitly talk about this with our employees in our onboarding process of our district expectations. And then the, the final kind of part of this section of the policy talks about that we want to make it explicitly clear that any use of racial slurs, derogatory remarks, or discriminatory language in front of or with students will not be tolerated under any circumstances. Such behavior not only violates our vision and culture statements and board policy, but also undermines the trust and confidence that students, parents, community members, and colleagues place in us. And so again, I want to thank Mr. Paddock from our Human Resources Department for his leadership in, in drafting this document and improving our onboarding process, aligning us back to our existing policies and culture statements. In addition to that, one of the other issues we had this year was about interaction with uh, social media and adults and our children, specifically with coaches. And so Ms. Robinson, along with Mr. Paddock, added in social media interactions, talking about the fact that we all live in this digital age and social media plays a significant role. However, as an FPS employee, we have a higher standard for you. It again goes back to our district policies. 8010 about digital communication is that everyone, every adult working with our students is governed by the acceptable use policies and this policy is uh, it further supports that. 
explicitly says that digital communication, the board expects that staff and students who engage in digital communication will do so in a reasonable and appropriate manner. Um, manner specifically digital communication between staff and students or to which students reasonably may be exposed should be professional and of the same content, tone, and demeanor as in school communication between staff and students. We explicitly communicate to our employees that school staff may not communicate with students through personal, social media, or other similar platforms like Snapchat that promptly delete evidence of those communications with students. Ms. Robinson took it further with her spring sports meeting with all coaches, um, talking about the fact that no coach uh, will be allowed to communicate with any student athlete without parents also being on that communication. And they, together with coaches, looked at um, different platforms for that communication that are um, that are accepted platforms such as the Remind 108, 101, Band App, some of the other ones that automatically include um, families. And so this is just kind of the, the broad strokes of some of the things that we're trying to do to improve. We know that, um, that this year we have had lots of feedback um, from many, many different sources, from our students, from our student athletes, from our parents, from our families, from our community, from people outside of our community, and had significant deliberation of this Board of Education um, to really do the very best we can to be responsive to those community concerns, and, uh, and we believe we are. So I just wanted to highlight that as part of an update. It's been a, a couple of board meetings since uh, we were able to give a little bit of an update on some of the steps we're taking to make sure all of our kids are safe and supported and treated with respect. That's the end of my district update. Thank you, Dr. Delgado. Next on the agenda, we have um, discussion items, um, textbook adoption recommendation. And I see coming to the podium, Dr. Kelly Coffin, our Assistant Superintendent of Strategic Initiatives and Innovation, along with her team. Okay. Good evening, Board of Education. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you this evening. Uh, we're excited to bring <laughs> some really big books for you to look at. Um, so this will be just the, the first uh, time of sharing with you uh, some sample, uh, the, the tech book, new tech book, textbook adoption uh, that we would like to do in a few of our courses. So I am going to introduce, have Christy Fifield come up here, introduce her team, and she will continue the presentation. Hi, good evening. I'd like to first start by introducing two of our amazing high school social studies teachers. We've got Katie Gustafson from Farmington High. She's also the instructional leader for the social studies department in that building. And Scott DeVoglaire, who teaches world history and AP world history at North Farmington. Um, and they will, they'll pipe in as we have questions and things. Uh, so we actually have four textbooks that we are bringing to you this evening. And with the new day and age of textbooks, textbook feels like the wrong term. So I think I refer to them in here sometimes as resources because there's way more than just the book, which I'll explain shortly. Uh, so the four courses that we're going to talk about tonight are civics, US and world history, which are all our required history courses for all students, and AP psychology, which is an elective course. So I'm going to begin with the required courses. I believe your agenda might have it the other way around. Um, so civics and US and world history, we are proposing the McGraw-Hill series for those three courses. Just a little background on the three courses. Uh, this is available in the course description book um, on the website. This, we have civics. This is our course description for that. Um, and if you're looking for some keywords, it mentions uh, civic engagement and public problems and collaboration in the descriptions. Um, same with American history as well. They're exploring American history through multiple viewpoints and lenses, including social, political, and economic. And world history, which is interactions among world's people and doing a deep investigation of global trends. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole description, but those are some of the key phrases in those descriptions. When we, as a social studies department, began looking at resources and working together to come to a, a clear vision as a department, we used this quote from the C3 framework, which is the framework that social studies uses as an instructional 
model. The, the curriculum is tied to the C3 framework. Um, and really, the, this quote was very powerful for us because it talked about students needing the intellectual power to recognize problems, ask good questions, and investigate history. It goes on and on and talks about young people needing strong tools for and methods of clear and disciplined thinking in order to traverse successfully the world of, of life, college, career, and civic life. So that was our, our frame for the work we did around this resource adoption. Um, as a department, we really had two goals for social studies. Um, our goals after we met a few times came down to needing new resources and incorporating more inquiry-based instruction in our classrooms. Um, and we can talk about this a little more in a moment. Uh, the, the current resource we have is approximately 20 years old for each of these three courses. And I believe we also don't have enough books that are in one piece anymore. So the teachers have been super innovative uh, with their resources, but we realized that we needed a common resource for each of those courses so kids could have a consistent experience. Uh, inquiry was the other goal that we focused on, um, and I'll go into that a little more in a moment also. So we actually started looking for books or resources about three years ago. We brought together a group of K-12 teachers, uh, social studies teachers, and talked about what should social studies look like. And we looked across the K-12 spectrum and we talked about what kids need. Uh, when they are adults as far as social studies instruction. And we had several meetings that school year to talk about those types of issues. We also had another team of teachers who was interested in looking at new resources for social studies. So we spent some time looking at the FPS vision for high quality instruction, the C3 framework, and the disciplinary literacy essential practices for social studies instruction and had a lot of conversations and developed um, our vision, which included more inquiry-based instruction. So the, that same school year, we had two teachers go through an inquiry training, um, a design studio through Oakland schools with teachers all around the county to learn how to plan and implement inquiry-based lessons. Uh, and then this school year, we brought in all the high school civics, U.S., and world history teachers, along with the instructional leaders, to do that same training in district. Oakland schools came to us. And we're almost ready to complete our, our third meeting with them, where teachers have been planning things and trying them. So it's been a really great process uh, with inquiry. And at the same time, we're still looking at, in, at I'm sorry, at resources. And it's sort of like the, the two projects kind of came together at the end, that we, we had inquiry in mind while we were looking for new resources, and that really influenced the product that we landed on as the one that we would like for our high school kids. Um, with all that said, the team recommends the McGraw-Hill High School Social Studies books. The, the three covers are here on the screen for you. We also, as we, we previewed these books, we used the Inquire Ed rubric for social studies curriculum. And we really focused in on the portions that, so, that mentioned uh, a wide range of perspectives represented in the text and how they handled more sensitive topics. So we really looked closely at those and came to a unanimous consensus on this resource. Um, it, this text provides historical content that aligns to our standards. It includes really broad and compelling questions to support the inquiry process. And it includes multiple historical perspectives through a, a large number of curated primary and secondor, secondary text pieces. And I keep using the word inquiry if that process is not familiar to you. Um, the, the, image on the bottom of the screen, the graphic, just shows kind of what inquiry means. It starts with a compelling question, uh, a, a question that can't be answered easily, generally very complex. And then it moves through an investigation where uh, kids will be provided multiple resources, uh, not only text, but videos, pictures, images, graphs, charts, maps, all sorts of things. 
and then they, they come to a conclusion, and then it generally culminates in an action. They learn things and then do something with it with a real life problem. Um, and that really ties to our authenticity. That's one of our district goals, our positioning goal, because it puts kids in the driver's seat for part of their learning, where they are the ones looking for ideas and answers using evidence and primary and secondary sources. Um, the, the structure of each McGraw-Hill section, there's an introduction lesson, which would be um, activating that prior knowledge, giving them some background information, and then they also learn the events lessons. There's lots of instruction. There's lots of, you know, it's, kids aren't just figuring things out on their own. There's lessons um, about historical concepts and ideas and people and all the things that we think of when we think of history classes. And then they are the, each unit has an inquiry activity and then a review and apply. And that's where that world, the real world part comes in. Um, I mentioned that this is more of a resource than just a textbook. These are just a few of the things on this list that this resource provides. I highlighted a few things on here. The inquiry journal um, is, is the, that inquiry section where it pulls out several sources and you, that's what actually the picture is in the back of this visual. That's the, each one of those is a different source for the same inquiry. Um, it's got projects and collaborative activities. There's in the margins of the books, there's culturally responsive connections. And one of the most exciting things about it is that there's an interactive ebook. So the kids will have the entire book digital as well as a hard copy in the classroom. And there's actually interactive activities and assignments and things that they can do with that. And because we have McGraw-Hill for middle school social studies right now, we know how that integration works and kids are already familiar with how to use that program. Um, so I'm gonna ask if either of the teachers have anything that they noticed while they were perusing these books and looking at them um, before we close out on this part. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that I know that um, we as a team were looking at was the um, the fact that there's an anchor text, which is the textbook, but the teacher's edition and the internet resources have a plethora of a la carte items that will help us inspire our own thinking in the classroom uh, to make those connections. And of course, right now with history, history is all about making pri looking at primary and secondary sources because that's doing history. And all the current... Um, research on best ways of teaching history and the social studies is interacting with those primary and secondary sources. Looking back at what those diverse um, voices have said in the past. Yes, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I also wanna add, it's been a long journey. It's been, I wanna even say more than 20 years. So back at the beginning of my teaching career, we picked at the time, what we thought were amazing resources, and they were, we were happy with them, but a lot has changed since then. So we are eagerly anticipating and really looking forward to getting our hands on the new resources that are out there. Um, as a teacher, one thing that I really loved about it too, there were lots of different resources, um, and so it, it wasn't necessarily like you have to use every single piece that's there. Um, you could pick and choose and work with um, what worked with your, your topic, the students that were in front of you at that time, the team that you are working with. Um, there was a lot of ability to um, shape and really make it distinctive and important for the students right in front of you. So anyway, we look forward to it. Um, one additional piece on here is that I've been working with Mr. Greg Smith and we've been looking at these books together. We know that no resource is perfect for every single person, um, but this resource offers so many opportunities, and he and I really feel like it does a really good comprehensive uh, job of trying to represent different perspectives and things, though we know that we are a unique community and we may decide to add some pieces in as well. Um, but he is also looking through these resources uh, with us. So for our proposal for, I'm going to shift these questions now for this one. If you have questions on the McGraw-Hill, we could take those right now. Ms. Smith? I don't have any questions. I'm actually 
I am excited. This is an early Christmas gift for me. Um, I'm sitting here, I just hate that it's so darn heavy. I mean, my gosh. If this was a cheat sheet, maybe in a small little portion, I would be like, give me a copy too. Um, I'm excited because it's government and civics. And I'm not dating myself, but, and I did have books, not chisels in school. But this is important for our students um, to know how our government works, whether you are Democrat, Republican, whatever it may be. And I am currently, and the reason I'm so excited about this is because uh, Dr. Coffin and I and um, Ms. Hendrickson will be working this week on helping students, um, educating them how to vote, um, and ed giving them some of the, like a cheat sheet opposed to this, on what we should be doing and educating, how to go and how to register them um, throughout the, and the reason I'm doing it with her and Ms. Hendrickson is because it's under curriculum. Um, so I'm excited and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is, this is, you don't have to sell me on this. I am more than excited. I'm looking at the um, index and everything. This is beautiful. So her and I will be meeting this week um, discussing how to get students um, and educate them with the same thing that you're doing. So we'll be piggybacking off of you all on this and getting students ready and geared up because we used to um, years ago have it where students could register to vote mm -hmm. so we can have those conversations. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, just to ahead. let yeah. you know, I just wanted to, um, to let Ms. Smith know we do um, do the voter registration drive every year um, okay. in the spring. Um, in fact, at Farmington High, we're actually postponing it till September this year, but that is um, a part of something we do. Okay. Well, the people that I'm working with, we'll all talk together. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And there is the digital version, so you don't have to cart that whole book around. That's the beauty of it. Other, other, questions? other questions? Mr. Rich. Uh, I mean, so again, this one isn't a question either, but looking at it as, um, you know, a lot of these books go up through the beginning of the 2020s, right? And one, a lot's happened since the current books that we're using, um, both world and US history, and so, needing this, having this, it's a good way, especially with the inquiry-based approach mm -hmm. of having that kind of question, because a lot of students will end up asking a lot of the time in history, why do I care? Why, why does this matter now? And it's kind of drawing that path for them to be like, oh, this is why. Yes. And so having that continued thing, especially with these kinds of resources, is fantastic. So great job uh, getting this together and presenting it to us. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fox. Uh, yes, I know you uh, mentioned um, Greg Smith, that he had an opportunity to take a look at this. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that he looked at and found that this would be appropriate for all of our students? So uh, he looked at a lot of it on his own. He's had it, he took it on a conference trip with him um, and did a lot of reading while he was away. We specifically recently looked at some of the items like the Middle East conflict in the book. Um, we as a team looked at the, like the, the slavery portion to see how that was addressed. Some of the things that we knew are topics that are important in our community, that they have a wide range of perspective represented. Um, and we talked about too uh, how the language in the book is, it's is it, language may never be neutral, but it's as neutral as can be in this text, that it, it provides a, a very objective, um, non-opinionated side to the topics. It gives all the perspectives, so you see all the angles, and he liked the inquiry portion as well when we were looking at that. But I'm sure he could fill you in too on more of what he looked at specifically. Ms. Williams? Yeah, thank you. Um, just, just a few things. First of all, I am also um, pleased to see some new textbooks in this area. Um, as Ms. Smith uh, mentioned, uh, very happy about that. It just so happened that, I don't know if it was yesterday or today, my days are kind of getting blurred. 
I noticed my daughter's uh, book, and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm so pleased. Um, I, I saw this uh, on the agenda a, a, a few days ago and just happened to be walking past her, her room and noticed her book and, and said to myself, we, we need new books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's great. I'm also really pleased. I, I had a, a few minutes to, to walk through and I want to spend a little bit more time here. It sounds like and looks like you've selected materials that um, are uh, inclusive, um, that are unbiased, that are also culturally sensitive. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for that as I'm going through these books. Um, I wonder, though, too, how, and, and I haven't gotten a chance to go through the teacher's edition as much, how do we introduce um, uh, discussion in classrooms and invite you know, different perspectives um, how does that work uh, in the classroom today, and how will it change, perhaps, if at all, with the, this, these new texts? Um, I think the, the texts in there, especially the teachers' editions, have plenty of tips and techniques to offer to teachers, old and new. Uh, you know, the old idea of can't teach an old do uh, old dog new tricks. Same thing, maybe with an older teacher. I'm just kidding, um, but. Uh, they have a lot of tips and techniques to uh, how to facilitate conversation, collaboration, talking about different perspectives, how to look for bias, how to be able to determine facts versus opinion, et cetera. Um, I, I think somebody asked this question, uh, I think it was Mr. Rich, about keeping current um, and so I'm clearly, uh, teachers have been doing that already today, given the age of our current textbook. Uh, how do we plan to continue to do that and, and provide resources to teachers so that they don't have to do it as much? I don't know how they're doing it now, but so that they don't have to do it so much on their own going forward. I was going to say one thing that was incredibly appealing about this particular resource is that the publisher continues to update materials regularly. So um, as things unfold, um, as events happen, um, they're continually adding different um, primary resources or um, speakers or um, they're all things that are that are updated. And I believe the subscription that we were looking at allows us to um, be a part of that for, you know, as long as the license is up. It's about five years right now. Five years to begin. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of questions or comments. Are, we're, are we talking about all of them? Because I have some questions. Um, one of the things, I mean, 20 years is like too long to update textbooks, so it's about time we're doing it, so good job. Um, I like the, the three-year process that you went through, so it's not just, oh, we need to do textbooks, let's pick something out. I like the, the process where you looked at what you wanted. I like the inquiry-based, you know, it's... Um, it just speaks to what our district is doing on the level as far as, um, you know, what is our what is our mission, what is our value, um, how do, how do we want to incorporate our profile of lifelong learner teaching and learning and best practices and the support for our teachers. So I really am very pleased to see the thorough process um, that's going on with this. Um, one of the things I liked, um, the U.S. history, because I'm sitting here looking at the U.S. history and, you know, current events in my lifetime are history now. And so how do you, how do you teach history? And so I like the way it was introduced by topics. And so there's overlapping of years. So it's, you're not teaching U.S. history on a linear scale, but you're teaching it by topics, which um, really goes, you know, speaks well to, um, the having updated resources. Yeah, I thought it was kind of cute. A turning point was computer changes society. So, um, yeah, I remember society without teachers, I mean, without computers, so. Um, and I also noticed the U.S. history and the world history. Um, you know, World War II is addressed in U.S. history and it's also addressed in world history also. And so our, our students are getting an opportunity for um, you know, learning um, different perspectives and different viewpoints and really, really having a, a you know, a well-rounded um, education when they leave Farmington. I had, a, I had a question on this inquiry journal. I don't, 
um, understand it. Is it is this a like um, workbook that teacher that students get every year? Is it disposable? And so, are we continuing? Or do we buy them every year for the students? Or how does that work? So it is a consumable workbook. We decided to do the digital version of that so that we can print out those things as we need them. Okay. Um, if we find maybe that we are using every page of those, then maybe we'll revisit that if we would like to actually purchase workbooks. High school kids tend to not want too many things to carry around, and the fact that it's all available digital, and they can do the work in the digital workbook and submit it that way through Canvas, that was attractive to them, to kids, and I believe teachers as well. Didn't, we weren't sure that having consumable workbooks for high school students uh, would make sense, but we have all the resources on, on the digital program. Oh, well, yeah, that's really helpful just because I, I know from, as a teacher, we had um, storage rooms full of consumable supplies that sound good, but the teachers don't actually use them, so yes. that, that is good. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had questions on, that we had the information on the numbers, and just mm -hmm. to help me understand, um, between um, the, the paper books and then the digital, like at US History, Farmington High School, they had 105 hard copies, but 215 digital licenses. And so what's the discrepancy so between that? So it's basically, it's a, the purchasing makes the numbers look a little strange. We are doing a class set of the textbooks in each classroom. Okay. So each teacher that teaches those courses will have a full class set in their room for students to use. But then we're purchasing the digital for everyone. So the, the difference in the numbers is that with the hard copy textbook, they also have a, it's a bundle purchase. So they will get uh, the digital version with that. And so if you add those two numbers together, that's about how many students we have taking those courses. So I think it's roughly 300 kids that would take a course, 105 hard copies, and then the 200 extra digital subscriptions. So just meeting the needs of, I, you know, learners, will you have enough hardcover if a student prefers a hardcover text? Will you have enough to supply them with them and also have the classroom set? Um, is, are you, are mm -hmm. you buying enough resources? So that's a great question. We did purchase a little larger than a class set. I believe we did 35 per classroom. And it, classes are generally about 29, I think. OK, and then I, I noticed that like um, you were just getting like two teachers' additions or three teachers' additions. That's the number of teachers that the number I mean, of, Oh, I'm sorry. The, the number of teachers that teach the course, are we getting enough teachers' additions? We added on for resource room teachers as well, so that they would, actually we added on digital copies. Resource room teachers preferred digital copies. Okay. Um, yeah, other board members? Ms. Weems. Yeah, one other question. I know we always provide an opportunity for the public to look at these materials. Uh, when will these be made available and for how long? There you go. They'll be at central office starting tomorrow. Yep. Starting tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I noticed we're getting, what did you say, five-year licenses? Yes. So is this something that, are, are these, 20 years is a long time for textbooks. So are, are we on a five-year cycle to review textbooks and, out, and update them by department? Or is, is this something that the district is moving towards um, so that we don't have to keep them for, for another 20 years if, if mm -hmm. things change, because society, things change yeah. rapidly, changing world. Yeah, so that is, that is the plan, to get back into cycles of review for each of the, the cycle, each of the subject areas. We may or may not always purchase textbooks as part of that review. There may be some additional information um, that, they, that teachers would request in addition to, uh, or, or rather than a new textbook. But yes, they'll be reviewed every five years. Okay, and there was also something in the um, 
purchase agreement or whatever about um, professional development or so can you just explain what that looks like and how there's is it just a one and done or is there ongoing support so McGraw Hill has offered us five hours of included professional development with our purchase they will come to us for I believe it's two half days and then another hour-long session in person um, in addition to that, though, they have a very comprehensive catalog of professional development videos online that we could use at any time. So, for example, if I'm a teacher and I want to try one of those inquiries, I could go on the website and there's a short video about how to do the inquiries with the materials and where, what you would need and where you'd need to go. So it's kind of like an ongoing professional development as you need it with those. And then we have the two half days plus an hour of them working directly with us. Okay. Ms. Williams? Um, when would these materials be made available? For students? Yes. Uh, we are hoping to have them in place by the fall. Great. Thank you. All right. Other questions from board members? Okay, thank you very much for um, your thorough presentation. Thank you. And thank you for, to our teachers that came and our, our um, leaders for um, your thorough research. Thank you. I have one other textbook adoption to present to you tonight. Um, we have over the last year been updating some of our advanced placement resources um, as required by the College Board to have updated resources. And we, over the course of the last year, the social, I'm sorry, the psychology teachers chose a new text. And we actually were going to present it last year, but they, they came out with a new edition just about a month ago. So we wanted to have the newest edition because that seemed like it made the most sense. Um, so the text that they chose is Meyer's Psychology for the AP course. And there is one floating around in that stack of books as well. Uh, the advanced placement course, uh, the adoption's a little bit different because they have a, a list of approved texts that they can choose from. And they looked at several, uh, this was about a year ago, and really liked the way that this text worked. Um, the course description is up here right now. It's, you know, very similar to the other that it's about developing critical thinking skills and you know, advanced placement courses, of course, are very rigorous, and they take the advanced placement exam at the end, so alignment to that exam is very important. And they found that this book, um, again, same rationale, the, the prior textbook is out of date. We needed a new book to align to the new AP psychology course and to align with our Farmington curriculum. And they chose Meyer's Psychology for the AP course. And you'll notice the copyright date is 2024. You can't get one newer than that. Um, and it is aligned with the College Board scope and se sequence. They like that the text is chunked in smaller modules to really facilitate um, reading and analysis for high school students. It included a lot of digital resources as well. There's um, the end of the chapter quizzes are formatted like the College Board exam, so they're practicing throughout. It included free response questions, and as with most new resources, now the digital resource component they thought would be really essential for their students. So they chose that Myers Psychology for the AP course. Are there questions on that, board members? Um, so, how often do the AP requirements change, and how how many years has it been since we? Is this twenty years old too? This is not twenty years old. Um, I would have to check the date on it. It is not the one we currently have. Is not. It's more than ten years old, I believe. Okay. Fair. How often do they change? College Board will update. Right, yes. When College Board decides to update the course, they update the course. Right, right. Yeah, and, yeah. and I understand that yeah. their guidelines are yeah. coming through the AP, yep. and so we yep. have to align with that. Yes, and I think we don't know how often they're going to do that. And so is this also a classroom set with 
yes. extra copies for yes. students that need them, and there's enough teacher mm -hmm. um, editions available. Yes, All we right. have two. We have one teacher in each building that teaches this course. Okay, and then um, are there any like disposable resources or anything that we're no. purchasing? Okay, no. so it's just digital, and mm -hmm. then the online or the hand yep. in hand. Yes. Any other questions from board members? Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, so that was discussion items. We're coming up to public comments. Um, there are public comment cards on the back table, and then there's a shaped disc, I don't know, octagon or something, a bowl to put the comment cards in. Um, during the public comment portion of our board member board meeting, members of the community are welcome to address the board. And each community member will have up to three minutes to speak. We actually have a timer on the um, monitor. A timer on the screen will display the three minute countdown for each speaker during public comment. Thank you for honoring this guideline. We wish to remind our community that this is a meeting of the board held in public to provide transparency, but it is not a public meeting. Um, so as a result, we're not going to engage in dialogue, we're not going to respond to your comments um, during this venue. But please be assured that um, the board members and our superintendent listens very carefully and will respond as appropriately in the appropriate um, um, venue. Okay, with that in mind, let's see what we have here. Um, we have uh, Mr. Bill Loveway, and then after Mr. Bill Loveway, we're followed by Chris Dianchi. Good evening. I would... Uh, that was a very timely presentation because in their textbook adoption discussion, they identified a concept called inquiry. It consisted of three parts. One, a compelling question. Two, rigorous investigation. Three, action. So I'd like to take those as my lead here. Yeah, for the compelling question, is reading proficiency of 58% a high outcome is 27% reading proficiency equitable. The second part is a rigorous investigation. What is a high outcome? Novi is 72% compared to our 58%. And Michigan education is abysmal. Action, who knows? This district doesn't engage in dialogue with our Farmington and Farmington Hills citizens. Thank you. Um, we have Mr. Chris Dianchi and on deck is Mamie Giller. Hello. I'm speaking today because I'm concerned about the district considering an increase in the target fund balance. I believe that we have a superintendent, a board of education, and a business office that has maintained a level of fiscal responsibility that will ensure Farmington will never face the types of budget failures that we've seen recently in areas like Birmingham, Ann Arbor, or um, Wayne Westland. Congrats on your latest award. Whatever the good intentions are that are driving this discussion about possibly setting up the next board in a better financial position, I caution you to look back to what happened to us from 2021 to 2023. In the summer of 21, the FEA negotiated a three-year contract with the district, but the district refused to budge on the idea of correcting steps or making teachers whole from all of our step freezes, even while holding a staggering 28% fund balance. They also seemed intent on finishing the negotiations prior to Dr. Delgado being hired. As a result, Dr. Delgado did walk into a very good financial position in his first year as superintendent. However, he was met in his first two years with 57 teacher resignations. Teachers who didn't retire, teachers who left to continue a career elsewhere because of the conditions and most response and pay. Um, and due to the shortage of teachers in a tight labor market, 
we were forced to hire in new teachers at a higher salary than some of our existing employees. And when the new district leadership team tried to stop that practice, they found it very difficult to hire employees. So they made the decision to reach out to us and come to the table to renegotiate the last year of our deal. This deal did wonderful things for the people that were struggling to make it. I only wish that the previous team had the foresight of Dr. Delgado's team and we could have retained the vast majority of those 57 resignations. We are thankful, very thankful for the work that happened last year. I believe it not only kept people in Farmington, but kept them in this career. However, I am concerned when I hear that we are looking at possibly increasing our fund balance target while you have other employee groups at the negotiations table. I can tell you that this fall I've had multiple teachers go to urgent care due to injuries caused by students. In almost every case, the room where the injury recurred were short paraprofessionals because we are struggling to hire people to take these difficult jobs. I would like to see the district focus on giving the ESP a contract that can attra attract and fill those jobs, make some of our classrooms safe, safer and enhance educational experience rather than being focused on our fund balance because I believe we are very healthy financially and I believe we have the people in place that will always make sure that we are. I think we could also look to our cafeteria workers to try and increase the number of food service workers we have in the district to help lunch and our bus drivers. We still have a shortage of bus drivers. So I would ask that you reconsider and vote no on any motion that puts more money in the bank when you're trying to negotiate with your other employee groups. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Nianke. Um, we have Mamie Giller, and on deck is Robert Gaines III. Good evening. Ooh. Good evening. In the last board meeting, there was discussion of the board adopting policy that would increase the fund balance, as Chris had just mentioned. Some of the rationale on this was based on the MSBO's guidance from over 10 years ago. This guidance is out of date, overly conservative, and not in line with our current realities in Michigan. With that being said, if you actually look at the MSBO's guidance and the considerations that went into the recommendations, you will see that it doesn't make sense for Farmington. The first consideration is the level of non-homestead tax base. It essentially says that districts with a low non-homestead tax base would be more likely to borrow. But as you saw in a presentation at the last board meeting, our non-homestead tax rate nearly, is nearly double our homestead tax rate. So this consideration isn't a factor for Farmington. The second consideration is a tax collection practice of the district. We currently collect in both summer and winter. FPS is in control of that factor and we could adjust the tax collection practice rather than borrowing or putting more money in the fund balance. The third consideration is fund balance level. Our fund balance level has been above pr the previous fund balance policies for seven consecutive years. There is no structural deficit within our district that would make this consideration unnecessary for Farmington. Our fund balance on July 1st was higher than West Bloomfield, Livonia, Novi, Wald Lake, South Lyon, and Southfield by a considerable margin. The fourth consideration is future operation for opening a new building. Opening a new building is not a reality in Farmington as we have closed, reconfigured, and renovated our current buildings. The fifth consideration is declining enrollment. We are no longer facing declining enrollment in Farmington, and we have actually seen an increase in the last two years. The guidance also states that the presence of reasonable fund balance and the stable trends help us with bond rating agencies. Currently, our bond rating agency is judged to be of high quality and subject to very low risk. Again, the MSBO's guidance went out in 2013 when there were cuts in state funding in the previous two years and cuts were anticipated in the following years. We are in the exact opposite situation with historic new investments in public schools, yet some are looking at the same guidance practices. We need to keep our focus on attracting and retaining high quality employees so that we can serve our students the best we can. Keeping an inflated fund balance target will only hurt the district as it looks to attract new employees. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Robert Gaines, the third, and on deck is Pam Clare. Good evening, board. I first and foremost want to say thank you for your service. 
I understand that the work that you do comes with a passion. There's not much things that I do in my life that I'm not passionate about. And one of the things I'm most passionate about is the support staff that you have here in this district. I am the president of your parapros, secretaries, media aides, and the one college career coordinator that we have. And to hear that we are looking to increase the fund balance as we are sitting at the table is a concern because we are struggling to fill positions with quality people. You can always put a warm body in a seat, but we thrive on the, the fact that we are a very strong and solid district. And you're not gonna have that without strong and solid support staff in your offices, in your classrooms, and in your transportation, because I know that that's another group at the table. Increasing the fund balance right now is saying that you'd rather put money away than to put money towards the people who are directly working with your students. First people they see in the morning and last at home, on their way home are the bus drivers. The people in the office, first people that people see when they come into any school, your secretaries. The paraprofessionals helping all of our students with special needs, no matter what it is. And your media aides. The amount of work they do is simply handling the computers for students. And that's not all that they do. That's just one of the big things that is required on a daily consistent basis that oftentimes interrupts their day, but they do it with passion and joy. And we have one college career coordinator. The position was two people at one point in time, and now it's down to one to service four middle schools to get students ready to be interested in or to find their interest in college. I'm asking that you can reconsider not adding to the fund balance at this time, but add to a thriving and living wage of your support professionals and transportation group. Thank you. Next is um, Pam Clare and on deck is Dr. Sean Black. Good evening. My name is Pam Clare. I am the president of BART Transportation of the Union. Um, over the past five school years, the district has transferred over $4 million from the Journal Fund to Capital Products Fund for purchasing buses. These transfers have occurred even though we have money located for buses from our last bond. We all know bond dollars can't be used for salaries, so we can't use bond dollars to hire bus drivers. But some reason we're transferring general fund, general fund dollars into a bus fund instead of using those dollars to help hire more bus drivers. But the reality is we have more buses now that we have drivers to use. We, so we are saving money for buses, even our bond dollars are available, and we are short on drivers. We now are looking at increasing our fund balance target, meaning even more money to move over to savings rather than being spent on attracting new drivers to fill, our, to fill out of routes. Please do not increase our target fund balance rate. Please stop transferring money into a bus fund. Please utilize the money to have, you have on hand to help us hire more drivers for all of the, our buses to work. This allows us to have every overcrowding our buses, shorten transportation time for our students. And most of our buses that we are now using are our old pushers. They hold more, bus, more students. And our newer buses are sitting in the lot because we can't use them because we don't have the drivers for them. Our buses are filled. We have some of our buses are red tagged because they are not allowed to have any more students added to that bus route because they can't get another student on that route. We need more drivers. We need to give, show them that we want them over to us, show them the, the money. Other, route, other districts are paying more money for their drivers than what we pay for our drivers. And they offer more benefits to them than what we offer them. So please consider not to do that. Please give us our drivers some money. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Dr. Sean Black. Good evening. My name is Dr. Sean Black. I'm a professional educator. Uh, my wife and I are residents of Farmington Hills since 2014. We became homeowners in this uh, district in 2017. We have two children right here, four and eight. 
Um, the four-year-old, I swear she was just an infant, and she was born right before COVID, and now she, all of a sudden she was four. I don't know where the time is going, but there she is. Our eight-year-old, <laughs> and she posed, yeah, on, on cue. Um, okay, we were talking about you. Thanks. And our son, he's an eight-year-old. He's at STEAM Academy. Um, I'm not here to talk about STEAM. Just want to let you know, I'm not here to, uh, I don't have anything to share about STEAM at this uh, moment. The reason I'm here is because as I, my intro is so you understand that I'm invested in Farmington Public Schools. Uh, we had an opportunity to go to a different uh, area, but we decided we wanted to be here. With that being said, when you Google Farmington Public Schools and you click on the news tab, what do you find? When you go on the education dashboard for the state of Michigan, when you look up Farmington Public Schools, what do you find? So with that being said, when you uh, look at the news tab, you'll find a 2013 Farmington Observer article, and there's a parent, uh, African-American parent, who says that she disenrolled two of her students, and then her two youngest students, she keeps them ho homeschooled. And it goes on and on about the reasons why. I'm not gonna, of course, belabor you with that. When you go on the education site, on average, 65% of black students in grades three through eight in ELA and 82% in math are below grade level, compared to 42% and 48% of white students, respectively. Conversely, teacher evaluation data, 99.8% are effective or highly effective. How can that be? So I'm here as uh, someone who understands education and someone who lives in the community to ask this board and the superintendent to confront the brutal facts of your current reality of Farmington Public Schools so you can change the narrative. With that being said, I have several recommendations that I believe can help the Farmington Public Schools Board of Education change the narrative. One starts with academic leadership. That will start with an across the board MTSS initiative at scale to decrease the achievement gap. Blair, sit down. Implement a high quality standards-based aligned curriculum in every subject and develop key performance indicators at the district, school, and grade levels to ensure academic accountability. Climate and culture, Dr. Delgado mentioned this, some of this earlier, but to implement policies and systems to promote academic and transparency, excuse me, accountability and transparency among staff members. Oh, my time's up already. So with that being said, I have a document, a 25-page document. Thank my you. son's gonna pass it out. I will send it to you electronically. Thank and, you. oops. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, that's all the public comment cards I have. Um, next. Okay. Kind of... Thank you. Um, are there any other cards out there while we're pausing? Okay, so we have um, Mr. Eugene Greenstein, and on deck is Tracy Gaines. All right. The floor Good is evening, yours. board. Since this is budget time, and we've been talking about reading, and we just talked about academic excellence in the previous speaker, I think it's important since we don't have a plan for grades six through twelve, and the numbers say we're deficient. Our students are deficient in reading. I think it's it behooves us to have a specific line item that allocates funds to address this deficiency. As we know, kids who can't read, lots of them end up in prison because they can't read. They don't have good lives because they can't read. So we need to do something about it. We have money in the uh, excess funds that we want to put away, as some other people have mentioned. Some of those funds ought to go to fix reading. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greenstein. We have um, Tracy Gaines. Hi, my name is Tracy Gaines. I just wanted to come up here as a parent in the district. I have been with the district since 2001. Since 2012, I don't know if you guys are aware, at the top of my pay scale, I received a raise of less than $1.50 over the last 12 years. The cost of living has gone up well more than that. All of the job postings that come out ask about ideas to retain and 
get more people interested in becoming a support staff. And the way to do that is to give them a livable wage. I've worked two to three jobs for the past 12 years so that I can support my family. As far as the bus drivers, as a pair in the district, we have not gone on a CBI through, for the SXI program due to lack of drivers. Before COVID, we used to go on CBIs all the time. Now our students are missing out on those educational opportunities for them and for the community because we don't have enough drivers. So I'm asking you guys to consider not raising the fund balance and putting your funds into your staff who have stood by you through all the ups and downs over the last couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's all I have. Are there any more public comments? Any more public comments? Hearing no more public comments, we will move on to action items. We have fund balance target range. Yes. Uh, I would be happy to introduce that topic. Um, do you want to put a motion on the floor and then we'll have sure. discussion? Um, let's see. Let's see. I have the. I've got it. I move that the okay. Board of Education approve the change in fund balance target range from the current range of 10 to 15 percent to 12 to 16 percent as presented. Is there a second? A uh, motion by Ms. Weems, supported by Mr. Rich. Um, discussion? Yes, I'd like to um, outline uh, a little bit of what we talked about in discussion the previous time, and I also would like to address some of the feedback that we've gotten on this. So the um, background here is that several years ago, um, the district was in a very poor situation um, with a fund balance that was uh, around 6%. 5% uh, just for context is where the state invites themselves to become your emergency manager because 5% is dangerously low. Uh, a fund balance is not a savings account. It is not um, a sort of money in the bank what it is, is funding that helps support the next week's payroll, essentially. Um, a 20% fund balance, which is what was budgeted for this year, which is higher than what we're proposing today, represents two payrolls. It allows the district to be able to pay uh, for uh, salaries and fringe for the district for two payrolls without receiving additional funding. Um, and so, yes, you might be able to consider it sort of emergency funding. It is also funding that helps the district not have to borrow. There are certain times during the year where funds come are low. The district only receives funding from the state certain times of the year, once or twice. I can't remember which one it is. But um, we have decided every year how we're going to collect taxes and we've also decided every year that we're not going to change how we collect taxes because we don't want to impact homeowners who've already prepared and planned to pay taxes X amount in the summer and X amount in the wintertime. And so if we wanted to more stabilize district resources, we would have to change that tax collection and we decided that we don't want to do that. We can change that, but we've made the decision year after year that we don't want to do that. We've also made the decision that we didn't want to borrow uh, money because that, that is a waste to, for, for me from an accountant's perspective. I don't want to pay interest if we don't have to. Um, back in 2017, 18, uh, we made the decision as a district to move towards a healthier uh, fund balance. 6% is not a healthy fund balance at all. Uh, our fund balance range at the time was 8 to 10 percent, and we decided as a board that that's probably too low and got us into the situation that we were in in the first place. Uh, because it was 8 to 10 percent, that was what allowed us to get close to 6 percent and close to the 5 percent, which is the um, uh, fund balance, which is not acceptable. So we raised it to 8 to 10, to, from, from 8 to 10 to 10 to 12, 
what is it now, 10 to? 10 to 15. 10 to 15, sorry. We raised it from eight to 10 to 10 to 15 um, with the understanding that we wanted it to be higher than 10 to 15. We wanted to be closer to what the recommendation was from the state and also from the nation, but we recognize that to jump from eight to 10 to closer to what the recommendation was, was too far a jump in any one year. So we decided at that time to, to gradually move. We moved to 10 to 15 and decided that we would have the discussion about whether we would raise it again at a later date. The Finance Committee decided, well, now's about the time to you know, revisit that discussion. And the Finance Committee uh, came to the conclusion that they'd like to raise the ceiling just one percentage point from a high of 15% to a high of 16%. That is one percentage point. And the rationale, again, for doing that was to get us closer to what we thought was optimal. We took a look at other districts across the area, uh, both that are in the surrounding Oakland County area. Uh, we also took a look at neighboring school districts. We took a look at districts around Michigan, some that are doing the, the highest performing districts and the lowest performing districts. And I sent all of that information uh, to you um, right after our fin finance committee meeting. Uh, right now, our target balance would be in line with all of the uh, neighboring surrounding districts. Recognize that our uh, fund balance right now is higher than the target. We had some discussions about that at the Finance Committee meeting and, and wanted to understand well, what happens when our fund balance is higher than we projected or our range and what happens when it's lower. And we decided that um, consistent with prior years, that range is a um, recommendation for how we plan for things in the district. What I'm happy about is despite the fact that our fund balance has been higher than our target, we've still been able to meet student needs. We're still supporting our, our, our um, students with curriculum, with new textbooks. Uh, we were able to, as we heard tonight, uh, increase uh, teacher salaries and steps uh, ahead of schedule. So we were, um, under Dr. Delgado's leadership, we uh, revisited a contract early in order to um, address steps and salary increases in an effort to you know, uh, make sure that our salaries were competitive. Um, so I don't think that raising the fund balance is it, it's, it, it's, um, it's independent of what we're doing with uh, salaries and staff increases. That is not um, contingent, especially because we're well within our range right now. In fact, we're above. So that has nothing to do with whether we would be able to support our uh, future you know, um, uh, salary increases or steps. Because we were able to increase salary and steps ahead of schedule by opening up a contract beforehand in order to be more uh, competitive. Like that, that had nothing to do with uh, what, our, what our fund balance was. And by increasing this high end of the range by one point, that would have no impact on our ability to continue to do things like that. Um, there was another instance a few years ago uh, where even though we have a fund balance that is higher than our target where the district decided and the board approved to provide a uh, bonus to every employee across the organization, which I think was unheard of, but again, that was done despite the fact that we have a fund balance um, that is what some folks consider to be um, higher than surrounding districts. I don't think that that is the case as an accountant. Um, I think having a fund balance between uh, 12 and 16 percent, which would represent one payroll, I think is um, completely acceptable. Uh, I would not like to be in a position where we'd had uh, less than one payroll's worth of funding to be able to support uh, the district in case you know something happened, which occasionally it does at the state level, particularly around the October timeframe when there's budget season. Um, so that's why I support uh, an increase um, of 1% uh, from 15 to 16%, and that was um, what we decided from the Finance Committee. 
Um, I, I do see here, and I don't know where this came from, some uh, information on employee compensation and fund balances. But again, we've been able to increase compensation for our employees, especially in the past couple of years, ahead of schedule, despite what our fund balance is. Um, so uh, with that, I don't have any further discussion. I'd like to open it up uh, through the chair to others. Yeah, Ms. Smith. Um, respectfully, I appreciate um, Ms. Weems breaking it all down, you know, as an accountant, um, but I'm not an accountant. Um, after hearing from our bus drivers and our pair of pros, um, I get the rainy day fund. I get, let's put something off to the side. But when we hear that our paras are working two and three jobs, but we got money sitting over here in the corner and we're not using it, um, that disturbs me. Um, to hear that bus drivers, we are in a great need of bus drivers. Um, I have watched those buses sit there and it looks just like a box of Twinkies. Nothing is moving, nothing. Um, we have advertised on top of advertisement. There are, when you drive by, there are signs up all over, we need bus drivers. Um, I think that me being a person that loves the union, and this supports our teachers and our staff. I understand that we do and we are taking care of our students. Just by tonight, looking at these great books that we have to offer. But I um, would not be increasing that due to the fact that um, it's nothing personal. It's just to hear the stories that I heard tonight. Um, and it's important that we, we are taking care of our students but we are not taking care of our staff. We just heard how uh, teachers are being, um, uh, you know, attacked, going to emergency rooms. If we look at our consent agenda in the past, we had a lot of teachers that resigned. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, that's, um, and none of this, you know, Dr. Delgado did inherit a lot of damage, um, a, sinking, a sinking ship. But I, as, as much as I have always supported uh, doing a fund balance or savings, um, what if we don't have an emergency? What if, and you, you hear the bus drivers say, we didn't get, we, look at what we're making. Um, your pair pros, as a former pair, that's a hard job, especially if you're working SXI, SMI, um, or an emotionally impaired student that may eventually do something in attack. But I am not in support, but I respect that Ms. Weems broke it down to us as well as she could. I get it, but I would not be supporting it. Other discussion? Uh, can I share a point of clarification? Yes. So um, I, I'm, I'm not going to weigh in. This is a board discussion, but I want to make sure that our Board of Education has the exact facts as they deliberate. So um, I've heard that you're going to distinguish the difference between a fund balance conversation and our ability to negotiate in good faith with potential raises. Um, but I have confirmation from our Director of Transportation and our Human Resources Department that we are fully staffed in transportation. We've worked just diligently for the last three years to hire bus drivers, to recruit them. Mr. Paddock and his team in HR has tried to make uh, the opportunity to recruit uh, bus drivers for keep strategies. We are fully staffed. Certainly we would like more bus drivers and we would like to have the ability to utilize our entire fleet, um, but I want to make sure that you have the facts on the ground as you deliberate this. Okay, and then if that's the case, remove the signs saying that we are fully, uh, we have the staffing. Because I'm hearing your side, and I'm hearing the bus driver's side. So I want the truth. And so, because there's always three sides to a story. I understand you're saying that, we, uh, that this is a fact. I haven't talked to anybody pertaining to the buses. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if we're not fully employing bus drivers, 
then let's, if, if we have, then let's remove the signs. Uh, other discussion? Ms. Fox. Yeah, I don't know enough about this to be very honest with you, but I am concerned um, about, you know, teachers, para pros, uh, bus drivers and secretaries, are they receiving the kind of um, funding that they have? Are they having that, uh, is, if, if we're at a point where um, are we, if we lift it up more or what have you, are you saying then, then that's a problem for us? What, I, you need to kind of give me a little bit more um, information before I can make a decision. Um, because I don't quite understand this, to be very honest. What I do understand is what I heard. And what I heard was that there's some bus, bus uh, folks and other parapros and what have you are not making enough money for their own living. So I need to have a little bit more information before I can vote. Can, can I, um, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rich. Mr. Rich. Yeah, just with respect to that, actually, I Oh, Ms. Williams to go first. To, okay. Um, sure. Um, so uh, through the chair, just to address um, uh, the question. Um, so I, I can't speak to whether the uh, current contracts provide for sustainable wages and living. I, I can't, I can't, I, I won't go into that because I don't have all that in front of me. What I can say is that the board uh, approved contracts that provided for increases in the last contract negotiations across all staff. And I believe based on our discussions, the board has a desire to continue to do that. Um, the fund balance that we <coughs> develop um, does not directly impact our ability to continue to do that. What the fund balance does is it sets a target that we already have in place that says when we prepare our budgets going forward, we want to make sure that we stay in this range. So when we bring in 100 grand, we want to make sure that we have at least uh, 12 grand left at the end of the year in order to pay January's bills, essentially. That's what we're saying. Um, when we put together the budget last year, uh, actually a couple years ago, I'm, I'm, um, I don't remember my time frame, but we decided that we were going to be able to provide for increases for staff across all of the bargaining units and increase scales across all of the bargaining units. And when we did that, that had an impact of having a fund balance left of 20% well beyond what our target was. So there's still room to do more, either for students or for staff or for innovations or for whatever it is that we want to do. But what we're saying is that we never want to go above whatever we say is the fund balance. So, so from my perspective, this increase doesn't prevent us from being able to do those things. We're doing them now. Like we're, we're, we're getting new textbooks. We're opening up the contract early and providing more um, for, for staff wherever we can. Um, and even if we were to increase to, by one percentage point to 16%, that doesn't mean that we can't plan for 12 or 13, or 14, all we're saying is that we want to stay within those guardrails. Um, and that present, prevents us potentially from, you know, getting dangerously low, and it prevents us, what we're saying is, if we keep it at 12, when we get to January, we're going to be able to pay that first payroll without borrowing, because we don't get our money in from the state until some other date. If, if we, d we, we were told, let me see what it is. I think it's, um, the district told us at one point what, at what point we would have to borrow. I can't remember what that number is, but this contemplates that. We want to make sure that um, whatever time period it is when the district is low on cash, that they don't have to borrow. 
that's where we usually set the floor mm -hmm. to make sure that we have at least that much to take care of the district's next two to three weeks worth of expenses. So that's where the, that's what's driving most of this. I hope that <coughs> yeah. answers it's the question better. a little bit better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rich. Um, I definitely understand board members do have additional questions and need some more information on that. With that in mind, uh, I'd like to make a motion to table this discussion until the next meeting. And in the meantime, we can get more information so that we can make a better, have a better discussion on this, as well as get some of these answers that we have, uh, allow the superintendent to check with his team on what this might have for impacting negotiations, for impacting uh, next steps and what our future plans as a district are. So we have a motion to table. Is there a second? Support. Supported by Ms. Smith. So there's a motion on the floor to table the discussion for further information by Mr. Rich, supported by Ms. Smith. Do you want to do a roll call vote? Yes, please. Uh, Ms. Smith? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Ms. Weems? Yes. Uh, I myself am a yes. Ms. Heinrich? Yes. Okay. The motion is, uh, is passed, and so this item has been tabled to the next meeting. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mr. Rich. Um, I have to find the current agenda. Consent agenda is next. We do. Yeah, okay. Open motion. Right, but as it's open, you're then able to table the current motion. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, so we don't have to. Okay, next on the uh, agenda is the consent agenda. Mr. Rich? Uh, I move that the Board of Education approve the April 9th, 2024 consent agenda as follows a approval of minutes sets the March 19th 2024 special meeting closed session session and the regular meeting second motion by mr. rich um, to approve the consent agenda uh, second by mrs. <clears throat> Weems um, is there discussion can we do a voice vote a voice vote all in favor aye opposed abstentions Thank you. Um, reports from board representatives. Ms. Fox, can you talk about the um, reading thing that was put on by Fappen? Oh, I had a good time. Um, Dr. Seuss is one of my favorite. Uh, my boys, uh, 28 and 25, I have the whole, uh, oh, probably 10 or 12, Dr. Seuss. So I went and bought the Dr. Seuss piece here, the big all red, and uh, doing the Fampin um, and the AKAs, uh, they put together a reading program. I had a chance to, um, to read to children, um, green eggs and ham. I love it. And I think they did too. And I think most of the folks who were there had a good time as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, the AKA really supports our FAPN, yes. and they just did a wonderful job with yes. all the stations they had set up. I was very impressed with the professionalism and the number of books that they brought in that the children um, were they gave able free to. Free books do. out to uh, parents and to students as well. Yes, they very did. Very nice. Ms. Weems? Um, yes, thank, that was a great event. I really enjoyed it. I wanted to just make the board aware. Uh, that I am the designee for the Oakland Schools budget process. Uh, per Michigan School Code uh, Section 380.624, Oakland Schools general fund budget has to be presented to all Oakland County 28 school districts uh, by May 1st of each year. Um, so as the treasurer, I will be the designee for Farmington Public Schools. I will review that budget, it is here. An electronic version will also be made available if anybody else wants to review it too. If you do and you have questions, if you could please share them with me, I will share them with Oakland County and get those answered. Uh, we're required to have a resolution on their budget by June 1st. So this will appear as uh, a discussion item and an action item at some point between now and June 1st. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of that. Thank you. Right, and I'd like to report that um, Student Roundtable um, canceled their meeting this week because of testing SAT and PSAT. So shout out to our students for re 
being responsible and taking testing seriously, um, but they are still reaching out to community members for their career fair. And so if you can share a career and support our students, um, the, Dr. Delgado will put you in contact with the, um, his office will put you in contact with the correct student representative. Um, is there any other board representatives? Um, with that then, we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you.